get there, but just a very simple message this morning, really just a reminder of uh, some of the basic facts about uh, Easter, the meaning of Easter. You know, the life of Jesus uh, is a historical fact. The, the question is not whether he existed, it's whether people believe he is who he said he is. And uh, that's that's the question. In uh, j- Just listen to these verses. In Matthew tw- 20, Jesus said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, Jesus came to, to give his life. He knew why he came. In Luke 19, a, a verse that many are familiar with, Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And that's why Jesus came. We were lost. We were separated from God. And God had made this plan, uh, and Jesus was the, the fulfillment of it. Many people know John 3.16, but John 3.17 says, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's why Jesus came. And he said he didn't have to come and condemn us because we were condemned already. (laughs) Uh, That was our condition already. Christ came to to save us. And, uh, of course, God wrote through uh, the Apostle Paul in, in 1 Timothy, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then his personal comment is, of whom I am chief. I know we, we all feel like that. You know, nobody could be worse than, than I am. Uh, but Christ died for sinners. Christ died for, for each one of us. And I just want to take us briefly this morning through the, the events of those last uh, the last day, really, of, of Jesus' life. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but in the Gospels, a, a lot of the Gospels are related to the last week of Jesus' life. It's amazing. He, he lived 33 years, and there might be you know 15 chapters about that, and then there'll be five or 10 chapters about the last week of his life because it's such an important uh, thing for us to understand. And uh, Luke 2, 22 and, and verse 8 there, you see that one of, one of the things that happened was the Last Supper. He, he told Peter and John, go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And you know that they, they sat and they, uh, they had the Passover, which then for us became the Lord's Supper. Uh, it, was, it was changed to a New Testament meaning. And if you remember the, uh, what happened, Jesus told them that one of them was going to betray him at that, that supper. And it was, it was going to happen that, that night. He didn't, didn't say that. But when they left that supper, they went to Gethsemane in uh, Luke 22, verse 39. He came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And uh, he, he began to pray. He asked them to pray. And they fell asleep several times. And finally, he just said, sleep on. And it was at that point, while they were there at the Mount of Olives at Gethsemane, that Judas, evidently he hadn't gone with them. He had gone and gotten the soldiers. And Judas came with the soldiers, with the people, and kissed Jesus. In uh, chapter 22, verse 47, we were saying in our Sunday school class that that's a normal Middle Eastern greeting um, in many, many parts of the world. Kiss on the cheek. Maybe two. Maybe three. <laughs> Depends on how, how, much, how well you know them and how much you like them. Uh, but it, it's just very normal. And yet Jesus said to them, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? I, I'm not sure why they didn't know who Jesus was. But they, did, they just wanted to make sure they got the, the right person. And Judas led them to him. And of course, then that, that whole night then was spent with various trials. It, it's really almost beyond our comprehension. I was thinking about it yesterday, you know, to to understand the physical things that that went on with the life of Jesus and then the the trials and crucifixion and so on. It's just almost beyond us to to understand it. But that whole night, Jesus was led from place to place and before different officials. Uh, First of all, he was taken uh, to the high priests. Part of what he went through was was the Jewish leaders. Uh, Other parts were with the Roman leaders. And only the Romans could actually condemn him to death. So the Jewish leaders made sure that he appeared before the 
officials who had the power uh, to do what they wanted done. Uh, Annas was one of the high priests, Caiaphas, uh, and they, they brought false witnesses. It was during this time that Jesus was beaten and, and the, the things that went on, that you know, he, was, he was spat upon. And, and it was also during this time that Peter denied him. Remember, as, as he was in the palace uh, being tried, somehow from the outside, Jesus could actually see and Peter could see in. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a terrible time for Peter when he realized what, what he had done. He was taken then before Pontius Pilate and uh, then before Herod, and then back to Pilate. And Pilate was the one who actually sentenced him in uh, Luke chapter 23. And, uh, well, verse 14, for instance, Pilate said to the people, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people, and behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man, touching those things whereof ye accuse him. Pilate couldn't... Uh, make it mesh with what they'd said and, and what the actual facts were. And yet they didn't want Jesus released. They kept crying out, crucify him. In uh, verse 22, he said unto them the third time, why, what evil hath he done? I found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. That's what Pilate wanted to do. And they were instant with loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. Boy, that's a great uh, justice system, isn't it? The one that yells the loudest gets the verdict. Um, yeah, this, this was not justice. It was a mockery of justice, and yet God was in it. We know that. He was taken from, uh, from that place and basically paraded. Uh, many people think that, the, uh, that the, the crossbar of the cross was actually strapped to him that he would have to, to carry it. But he was so weak from the, the night and the punishment uh, that he, uh, he fell. And they, they, they took a man there in, in chapter 23, verse 26 and 27, Simon of Cyrene, we know his name. And they, they put the cross uh, on him. Uh, strange uh, part of history. Verse 27, there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and, and lamented him. Uh, th this was a, a public humiliation, public crucifixion. And then he was taken and he was crucified. You know, the, the physical facts of it. And yet again, it's just, it's just beyond comprehension to think of, of taking a nail and driving it through a person's hand or, or the upper part of their, their hand there, uh, th through their feet. And yet here's three men uh, disposed in, in that way. And if you know anything about the crucifixion process, basically they die of asphyxiation. Eventually, they get to the place where they can no longer breathe. They can no longer push themselves up and get that, that breath as their, their lung fills with, lungs fill with fluid. And, and it was a terrible, terrible uh, method of, uh, of uh, putting someone to death. And even as he's on the cross, he's ridiculed. You, you remember, even the, the other two, the, the two thieves on either, either side of him, uh, they begin to ridicule him. And uh, the soldiers are gambling over his clothes and, and so on. Uh, it's just uh, a very strange uh, situation. And seven times Jesus is recorded speaking from the cross. Uh, the first thing that we see is he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a wonderful Savior we have. We put him there, and he says, Father, forgive them. He says to the to one of the thieves, you know, at first they both condemned him, but then one of the thieves said, we're here for our sins. This man has done nothing amiss. Uh, in uh, verse 43, Jesus said to him, uh, in verse 42, he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, verily I say unto you, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. What a blessing from the cross. Uh, someone comes uh, with the Lord to, to, to eternity. And then his, his mother and John are there at the cross. And he says uh, to his mother, to Mary, woman, behold thy son. He says to John, behold thy mother. That's recorded in, in John 19, making sure that she was looked after. He said, I thirst. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, the, the greatest part of salvation's plan was God himself. That God himself would become a man. I, I don't understand it all but that God became human flesh. The Bible says manifest in the flesh. You know, because God was manifest in the flesh, 
because Jesus was walking on earth doesn't mean that God wasn't also everywhere. There's only one God. We only believe in one God. And yet God, uh, God the Son, uh, manifest in the flesh, dying for us. And God the Father somehow turns his back on God the Son because he's bearing the sins, your sins, my sins, your sins, my sins. The sins, the Bible says, the whole world, past, present, and future on Jesus Christ. The Bible says that there was darkness at that point. At about this time of day, a little about noontime, it became dark like night. And some of the last things that Jesus said were, Father, into thy hands do I commit my spirit. And then he was able to say, it is finished. You know, I was thinking as, as the men were reading today, we don't know what his voice sounded like, whether it was a strong call, whether it was a weak whether it was, we don't know. But we know the words because God has recorded them. And he was able to say it is finished because it was finished. He had done what was necessary. He had taken the, the sins, your sins and my sins, upon himself. And at that point, a man named Joseph of Arimathea, and uh, I think it's John indicates that Nicodemus, remember Nicodemus, the man who came to Jesus by night? Uh, they came and, and got the body of Jesus. And as the custom of that day, they, they put spices on him. Uh, they wrapped him in, in fine linen, the Bible says. And uh, Joseph put him in the tomb that he had for himself. You know, that would have been such a, a strange and fearful time as Jesus was in the tomb. Here was the man that they believed. You know, John had, or Peter had said, thou art the Christ. You come, meet, come meet this man. He's the Messiah, they'd said to people. And now he's dead and, and in the tomb. It must have been a strange and, and fearful time. And yet, when they went back to the tomb, the first day of the week, early in the morning, as the Bible says, yeah, I've often thought about that. I, I don't know what they expected to find. I, th I think they probably expected to find a, a closed tomb with a dead body in it. I, I don't know. Although that one lady, Mary, had anointed him for his burial. I, I, I don't know. But when they got there, the door was open. The angel was there. And basically he said, why seek ye the living among the dead? Why are you looking for him here? <laughs> he's not here, for he's risen. You know, it's such a simple story. It's, you know, the account is really so simple, and yet it's so profound uh, for eternity. Now, this has to do with eternity. The, the Bible says in, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 3 that it's the resurrection that is our proof that he's who he said he was. Romans chapter 1, verse 3 says that, that he is made of the seed of David according to the flesh. That's his physical heritage. He comes of the line of David and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That's how we know that he is who he said he was. Amen. Not just because of the miracles, not just because of his words, but because he rose again. Without the resurrection, Christianity falls in a heap. Uh, Paul wrote, without the resurrection, he said, I'd be of all men most miserable. And that's true. Without the resurrection, we don't have a living Savior. But the resurrection is true. We do have a living Savior. He rose. Uh, he walked with them. He talked with them. He ate. He, he gave them uh, his message. Wouldn't you have loved to have been on the road to Emmaus as he opened to them the Scriptures? <laughs> well, he still does that today through his Holy Spirit, but... Uh, you know, what an amazing thing it must have, have been. And then they saw him go to heaven. I, I picture them there standing there with their mouths open. <laughs> and the angel says, you know, time to get busy, boys. Get about your, your, your Savior's business. And you know, as, as Jesus went through all of this for us, there was a lot of different reactions in... Um, Luke chapter 23 and, and, and other places, you see the hatred of some of the people. You'd think it would be bad enough that he's on the cross and all the things that have happened to him. And yet still, while he's on the cross, they're, they're abusing him, calling out and, and mocking him and so on. Now, there was a real hatred there from, from some of the folks. Uh, Luke 22, 2, it says the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him. Uh, this was a plan that they'd, they put into motion. Luke 23 and, and verse 35. 
And the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. Just mocking him there. And you know, that's, that's some people's attitude today of, of Christ. You meet people every once in a while who, it's not that they don't, don't believe, it's not just that they don't believe, they, they hate him. And they go out of their way to, uh, to oppose Christianity and Christ and the Bible. But you know as well, you see there at the cross, the centurion. Do you remember him in verse 47 of chapter 23? We don't know much about him. Here he says, the Bible says, Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Another place records that he said, This, this was the Son of God. Now, I don't know if that was a saved man or not. I hope so. I think so. But you know, I think he pictures the way some people are. A lot of people have a lot of goodwill for Christ. You ever met people like that? They like the idea of Jesus, but they're not Christians. Now, this, this man may have trusted Christ. I, I don't know. But you know, some people, their attitude is, well, he's, he, he's a righteous man. You know, a lot of people say that about Jesus. He was a good man. He, he came and he, he showed us how we should live. Listen, Jesus wasn't just a good man. Uh, someone has said, you don't classify a liar as a good man. And if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, and he knew he wasn't who he said he was, then he was a liar. You don't classify a lunatic as a good man. <laughs> you know, if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, and he really thought he was, that means mean he was insane. But Jesus said and was who he said he was. He's the Lord. And it's not enough just to have goodwill toward the Lord. We have to have faith. We have to believe who he is and what he said. The centurion had goodwill. The two thieves there in, in verse 39 says, one of the malefactors which was hanged railed on him saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. And at one point, both of them were, were mocking Jesus from the cross. Man, that's, I guess you got nothing else to do. Uh, they were having a, you know, giving him a hard time as they all three were being, being crucified. And one of the thieves, his attitude was unbelief. Same situation, but unbelief. That's a lot of people. You know, that they're, they're dying in their sins, but they won't believe the Savior. The other man turned, and verse 4, the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Wow, talk about a last minute conversion. Uh, that's exactly what happened to this man. He believed. And the question that I would put to you this morning is, what about you? You might be like the centurion. You might think, oh yeah, Jesus is a good man. If, people, if more people would follow him, we'd be better off. You might, I don't know, you might be like the, the rulers. You, maybe you hate Jesus. Or maybe you're like the thief who just wouldn't believe. Or maybe you're like the thief who has believed. I hope so. Easter has a meaning. We meet on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, because of its meaning, because of the resurrection. It's not about bunnies. It's, it's not about eggs. You know, for the world, it's God's plan of salvation from hell. We often use the word saved and salvation, but we don't all, all, always add that what we're saved from. <laughs> salvation has to do with being saved from hell, being saved from the judgment, the condemnation that we rightly deserve. It's the gospel. God has described what the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I declare unto you the gospel. And then here's his description, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Christ's death, burial, resurrection according to the scriptures. Christ, God wants us to believe the gospel. He wants you to believe the gospel and apply it to yourself. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What a blessing. You know, God doesn't like us because we're nice. God loves us because that's just the way he is. I guess you could say he can't help himself. And God didn't offer salvation as a last minute desperate attempt to try and rescue a few people. This has been God's plan right through time. Yeah, you, you can go back to, 
Uh, you can go back to the Psalms, Psalm 22, and read about Christ's crucifixion before they even crucified people, before it even took place. I don't know how long that was, a thousand years or more. You can go back to Isaiah 53 and read about the crucifixion, 700 years before Christ, and read of, of God's plan. But you know, the, the one that really amazes me is when God says in Revelation 13, in verse 8, he talks about Jesus. He says he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. See, when God was making the world, man, I've had projects like that. Um, you don't know it, but it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt. Well, God knew. God knows. And as he was creating us, as he was hanging the stars in place, he knew that in time, he would be the Savior. Amazing. God's plan all along. And God is satisfied with it. The Bible uses the word propitiation. We don't commonly use that word much anymore, but it means satisfaction. It means covering. It has to do with the mercy seat. You remember in the, in the temple, in the tabernacle. And God says in 1 John 2, He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's the covering. He's the satisfaction. Uh, Jesus Christ. God is satisfied with what Jesus did. 1 Peter 3, he writes, Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. You know, when Jesus was finished, he was able to say, it's finished. It was enough. We don't have to add to it. Uh, your good works, my good works, they don't help. You know, that, that's not going to make us more saved. Uh, God has worked salvation's plan, and it's through Jesus. What he's done was enough. For the believer, it's the promise of everlasting life. Aren't you glad that you can, you can look in God's word? You, you know, I often go to Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I love that. There's times I don't, you wouldn't believe this, but there's times when you're preaching doesn't feel like a Christian. You know, you, I don't know what it is. You get a bit stroppy or, you know, whatever. And, uh, but I can go to God's word and, and my faith is not in my feelings. My faith is not even in my actions. My faith is in the Savior. And what a blessing it is. Jesus said, because I live, ye shall live also. He said in John 5, 24, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Uh, circle that word, underline that word, hath. You know, when you trust Christ as Savior, you have everlasting life. It's not something you're trying to work out. It's something God gives and shall not come into condemnation. Praise God for that. But is passed from death unto life. For some, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, Easter, God's plan is a challenge for you to believe. God's call is for you to believe it. Jesus' claim is, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And what a blessing it is to know the Lord Jesus. We saw why he came. Why did he die? Well, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, Christ died for our sins. We read in 1 Peter, he died the just for the unjust. See, he was the lamb. He was the perfect lamb, the only sacrifice that was acceptable. He died the just for us, the unjust. And we read in Romans 5, 8, he died for us. God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what it's all about. You know, a lot of people look at Easter and they, I don't know what they think really, but it's kind of like it's somewhere else, someone else. Listen, it's very personal. It's about you. It's about me. Christ knows you by name. He knows your secret thoughts. And he loved you enough that he died for your sins. Personally. That's what it's all about. He died for us. There's been a variety of responses to Jesus over the year over the years. The question for you is, how will you respond? Will you respond to him personally? 
with faith and love. What will you do with Jesus? What will you do with Jesus? Now, you can know the true meaning of Easter. You can recognize that without Christ, you're separated from God. Now, that, that's so important. And in honest repentance, admit that you need to be saved. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no exception. All have sinned. We need to realize, you can realize this morning that God loves you. He showed his love by dying for you. You can believe that Jesus died for your sins. Many people know John 3.16. Do you believe it? For God so loved the world. You can put your name in there. God so loved Doris, Bob, John. A lot, of, a lot of names. God knows them all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the kind of life we want. And you can receive the risen Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord, by faith. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the Bible says in John 1, 12, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name. The new birth, that's the beginning. Trusting Jesus. And then he, he, he'll take you from there as his child. Uh, this morning, we're going to close with the song. It's page 150 in, in your hymnals there. It's the song, He Lives. <laughs> I hope you believe that. He Lives. We get to Israel to come and, and lead us in that song. Listen, if you're not sure about eternity, uh, every day people step into eternity that didn't expect to. Don't put it off. Deal with it today. Uh, after the service, uh, seek me out. And uh, with a lady, I'll have a lady to, to talk with you. With a man, we'll get a man to talk with you. And, and listen, we can show you from the Bible how to be saved.